I came through Dalesford maybe two months ago, and I was over at the petrol station filling up. Um, and I look up, and there's just someone hooting down the road on their bicycle, leafy greens <laughs> out the back, timber on the front. I'm like, that's fucking Patrick. <laughs> and just you like buzzing down. Um, yeah, it was it was amazing. Um, what you and me do here, um, and in the local Dalesford area, it's one of the few, uh, at least that I'm aware of, few like committed, courageous setups of being willing to relinquish standard capitalistic mindset and to just drop as many layers and continuing to drop layers of like, no, no, let's just get closer. Let's localize more and more. And I heard a line yesterday, um, uh, be famous for five miles. Mm. And yeah. it's like, that's, that's yeah. Megan Patrick for mm. sure. Like, um, yeah. Like what, what mm. compelled you both? I had a lot of anger for the system that I'd inherited and I was, directing that through different art projects and collaborative projects and looking at the whole art world as just another industrial um, uh, set of economies. Even someone like Banksy, you know, walls have been taken down by billionaires oh, right. and, and reassembled in their private homes. So it was in an art c collaborating um, with a practice uh, of, I guess, anti-art anti-capitalist art and then we were starting to get invitations to the museums and art centers and stuff like that so um so we dissolved that and then meg and i started artist as family and we then we also got in, started doing projects and started getting invited to do things and and the mca in sydney said you know we'd like to collect some of your stuff you know we want to have it in the collection it's just like there is nothing <laughs> i don't have anything and that i guess was the whole point that um so artist's family became this sort of radical performance art family um, with our eldest boy Zeph, or um, makes the stepmom to death and he was about eight or seven or eight at the time and um but it was like our household's transition away from fossil fuel dependency and how to do that in a community um, setting. And so art became putting on a workshop or bringing people together to see a film um, or um, it, some films we were making uh, on how to, to do things like how to raise carrots. Or it, it, it just became everything. And like, as we were learning, we were sharing and so the practice was sort of almost like a documentation uh, practice of, of how our household was transitioning from, you know, regular two cars, bin liners in the bin, you know, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty standard sort of Western way of living to, you know, this not having a single flush toilet, um, being car free for, 13, 14 years, yeah. um, you know, radically transforming our economy from 100% reliance on the neoliberal monetized economy to just 20%. Yeah. And so that 80% means relationships, it means skills, and just over, I guess, 15 years, just that slow step-by-step -step, um, exchange of um, skills and economy to what we call neo-peasant, applied neo-peasantry, okay. which is a, a reclaiming of land bonded ancestral ways of being. So on foot, walked for food, walked for medicine, walked for energy as much as possible. And so, yeah, we still, we still buy things in and we still buy stuff, um, but that's, a small part of the picture. Mm. 
these days. And, and so when the pandemic hit, um, our central banks were our, our fully stocked woodpile and our fully stocked cellar. And, um, and so economically, we were really prepared for, we'd been preparing for these things, not as preppers, more as like the neighborhood, what, what um, Daryl Taylor talks about, the neighborhood, we've arrived there too. Yeah. And in COVID, that was the most exciting thing, to see this even more strengthening in the neighborhood sphere. And I think starting a bushfire mitigation informal group with neighbors and just because neighbors stop and they're on a walk and they see that you're, you know, blackberry surfing down the slope and go, oh, that looks cool. What are you doing? And then you start talking about fire mitigation and it's like, oh, I'll help you. Let, text me next time you're going to do some stuff. Yeah. And so just growing those networks. And so when COVID happened, um, we had this really strong neighborhood of around 30 households. Um, on this sort of southwest part of, of the town and and so sharing of resources checking in with one another and so yeah community sufficiency is something we've been really pushing for a, a long time like you know this the, the idea of self-sufficiency and that prepper um uh prepper idea of you know the of the nuclear family is 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 pretty vulnerable um but when your economy is spread is not say in this central bank modality but it's also not just a replacement like in some sort of formal barter system like let's or something like that it's actually multiple households who have multiple different resources yeah that you're in a flow of gifts and a trusted relationship with and that that to me that to me seems um highly adaptable and so whether it's a bushfire whether it's floods, whether it's um, war, there's a whole lot of scenarios, whether it's the increasing um, heavy handedness of the state, the enclosures of like, it seems like the state in the last few years, it's really targeting people like us who are living a one planet existence um, because the state wants people to live in the fourth industrial revolution so-called eco fix which is yeah, sure. a lot of greenwash yeah. and a lot of mining that has to happen but, but then there's this sort of you know wood fire wood heating is being targeted um as this polluting thing yeah. um whereas you know what's often missed from that is just the huge infrastructure costs and fossil inputs to create an industrial grid or to maintain an industrial grid it you know every log of firewood runs nine appliances in our house right. we are a home-based home economy and we use two kilowatt units of power a day and the average australian is 18 and the average american is 28. Fire out. so and yet we're at home making using the workshop, making food, um, preserving food. So we are using power and yet that hub, that oven, stove, dryer, hot water system, everything is uh, a toaster, a kettle, all these things are driven by this one unit. And we walk for or ride our bikes to get that fallen wood. Mm. And we selectively harvest and have a relationship with the forest. And then the wood ash gets sifted and the charcoal is separated and crushed, activated with our urine, goes back into the forest, goes back into the garden. Yeah. And the potash goes back into the forest and back into the garden. So mm. there is this, when, when you hear this simplistic uh, argument against wood fire um, as, as renewable, like truly renewable energy, particularly when where we are in a town surrounded by forest and we can walk for our energy and there is no industrial, um, we have a small, uh, sorry, we do have a small uh, one kilowatt solar system and that's back onto the grid. We did that about 12 years ago and mm -hmm. and so that's the, that pretty much neutralizes our power, that one kilowatt system. Yeah. But we won't be replacing that because we're sort of aware of just how much 
biome destruction occurs with um, with solar panels and wind farms and EV cars. So these these so-called fixes. I mean, for us, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, solar and wind seemed good as a kind of methadone program yeah. to, to bring us off oil and just to have this sort of. But now it's like supposed to replace oil. Yeah. So it's it's like a mining bonanza that has to occur, and the destruction of more destruction of the land around the world, in what, particularly in Australia, because with so many rare earths and essential minerals yeah. for that so-called green tech revolution to take place. So, yeah, so like I think this sort of having a one kilowatt solar system has been our methadone program, our ability to scale down so is that if we lost power, we would be totally cool. Yeah. Um, and we would be, uh, but, you know, we may also lose this, this, we may be, um, environmental or you know, refugees or we, uh, you know, there's so many possible scenarios and that's where hunting and foraging is really important, particularly mm -hmm. raising our kids with those skills because we may be on the move as well. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a reality that's kind of, that's a harder one to come to terms with. It's like you might have to actually walk everywhere and get all your own food and you know avoid dangerous mobs that don't know how to do that don't know how to build relationships so they're kind of relying on heavy-handed tactics um a friend of mine who's now a permaculturist used to be an sas um soldier and he had gone to many parts of the world where there was uh, unrest. And what led him to permaculture was that the, 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 the guys in the jeeps with the semi-automatic or fully automatic weapons um, were in a, always in a crazed state, um, worried about being shot at. Uh, they're in a kind of rape and pillage mentality, yeah. dangerous men to be around. Yeah. But the villagers that worked together would have ways to alert everybody that these men were coming into the villages. The women and children were hidden from view and there was a little bit of food left out. Right. But most of the seeds, most of the food was, was hidden from view. And so seeing how effective um, people working together mm -hmm. compared to the crazed dudes who had no anchoring, no grounding, no, yeah. no, lo no love, no regular good nourishment, um, and um, and probably all the psychological stuff of like, who, what are, what are we fighting for anyway, but just being caught up in the cycles of violence that young men are led to with this promise of salvation or whatever, whatever the promise is from those who are engineering those men to be in those jeeps. And so his story, I mean, this is second hand. I haven't experienced this myself, but hearing that story um, just really galvanized just the importance of small groups working together. And regardless of the, what, you know, you can see Mad Max, like yeah. type scenarios are potentially there, yeah. but you can also see how the strengthening of people's um, uh, resilience and care for one another in times of crisis that always the care across households and across the streets always ramp up as well. So that's a really um, important thing, consideration, because I think if people are just focused on the Mad Max thing, then they're, they're focusing on they've been missing out on the potential resilience that lies in building deep relationships with not just people, but of course with country as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of where the, um, the distinction between say a localizing resilience as opposed to prepping, like prepping is like, I need to have as many of these resources for myself, you know, just 
locked away. I need to have my guns. Um, and it's yeah, it's not it's not about the building relationships. It's mm -hmm. like that's essentially irrelevant. They're like, no, no, I've just got to look after me and mine, mm -hmm. and ride it out until the power comes back mm -hmm. on. And you know, some of the preparedness for that sort of it starts with being comfortable having a shit without toilet paper, you know, and doing a, a respectful shit in the forest. And you know, this is so extreme for most of the culture now. Yeah. Um, and you know, we saw with COVID what the toilet paper <laughs> <laughs> the rush on loot paper is like, wow, that's really <laughs> so there's nothing more beautiful than taking shit like the mammal that you are in yeah. a forest. Yeah. That's a and the other thing too is embracing uncertainty. If you think that you can build a bunker and maybe, you know, people are, are intelligent to build a nuclear bunker and you put a whole lot of canned food down there, well, what happens next? Mm. There's a beautiful film called The Babushkas of Chernobyl okay. about these ladies who were uh, elderly, they're elderly now, but they were, everyone was taken out of the contaminated zone in Ch Chernobyl in U Ukraine, and, and they were sort of shunted into these other villages. And the a bunch of women stole back um, mainly women, so there were some old timers, old, old men as well, but um, they had since passed on when this documentary was made. And they were living in highly radioactive, their traditional village, their indigenous village. Right. And they were outliving the women and the, the people and the men in the villages in the so-called safe areas. Right. Because they were happy, they were in their country, they were perform they were fishing, they were foraging, they were gardening, they were in wow. there and they were outliving radically. That's why. And so what that made me realize is just if you are happy and you have meaning, or not happy in the capitalist sense of yeah, the word, yeah, but yeah. if you have if you have purpose and meaning which brings a certain amount of joy and you have connection, um, and you know, I, I would love to know what it, what it would be like to live generationally in my ancestral villages. I mean, that would be, um, but I love this land here and I'm becoming an ancestor of this land, whether that's correct or not. That's just what happens when we're, we're, we become emplaced and then bonded to somewhere. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's, there's an intimacy that uh, we have with this land as a family and, uh, and many of our neighbours and friends and the community know the land, know it intimately. And so there's, there is a sense of, like while we may have to be on the move, there also may be a a pull to come back to the land that knows you mm. as you know it and those sort of relation those relationships are um, so beyond the measurement that science can offer yeah. and I think that that story of the babushkas um, in Chernobyl is just such a remarkable I mean because there's a story that most of us know about the incredible biodiversity with the absence of most people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the, the babushkas are also living this sort of freedom that they probably didn't even have when. Yeah, sure, because they have been yeah. totally left alone. Yeah, like exactly. no one's, no one else is coming in there. Yeah, there's a few services that come in. There's a few people all suited up and, but they're really doing it underground. Like they're not supposed to be there, but the authorities turn a blind eye just because this is their space and they want this is their beloved homeland and yeah so that film was pretty amazing and then as i said with the sas friend um you know they it's just they, they these stories just 
unbox um, my mind and and with all the stuff that I, I have like you know moving through country as a tracker and learning those skills and as a forager and yeah, learning those ancestral skills and reclaiming those ancestral skills, just like the farming and gardening aspects. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, we might be on the move with us, with with our with our blurred, and um, you know, and then that could you know, I've often thought of having to to move from here and and just to be moving through country, shepherding, and um, just with just even with a a small handful of animals and um, yeah that, that that's now possible because we have those relationships with those animals and yeah they may be stolen and they may be killed and we may be killed or for the food or some crazy thing might happen and we might be isolated because we're moving just as a small family yeah. and so vulnerable in that way and we've lost connection but you know there's I think the embracing of uncertainty um, and you know, the, there's nothing, there's nothing assured. There isn't any way in life, but particularly I think where we're standing right now, uh, in this collapse of, of the empire, and just the destruction that will take place with that collapse, the, the greed, and the base behaviours that are coming, but there's also beautiful things that are coming. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, it's that embracing uh, uncertainty. That's that's definitely an aspect there. Because yeah, security is um, it's not assured anywhere. Mm. It's like um, my friend. She would tell me that like we're we're three like most of us living in the West. We're three bad decisions or mistakes or calamities away from being homeless or destitute Mm. and it's like Mm. you lose your job Mm. you lose your rental Mm -hmm. um and you don't have a support network like boom you're you're out Mm. you know um and having that having that community resilience that you know Mm. you can shack up with someone close by for a, for a time or maybe someone has worked for you or you know the forest so you can at least go and get some food or you know you've kind of you've got those that that local thing there you know you're not reliant on the on the capitalist tea to to, mm. to feed you and provide mm. yeah. yeah yeah there's um, a book i read when i was probably your age called the wisdom of insecurity by Alan Watts. Um, I was just think when you were talking, I was thinking about returning to that book and to see what gifts, if any, are still in there. But that really set me on a course uh, of un- again unhinging mind from needing to have certainty. And Stephen Jen- Stephen Jenkinson is also really important in this space. His work, particularly around end of life stuff, mm. because. I think because like often it's he's a, he's a former palliative care um, worker and um, and so just seeing how badly we do death and just you know how important it is to do death well mm. and so many of us will be facing our death probably well before our biological age and so even those of us who may be reasonably well prepared or you know have got some skills you know we're all just as vulnerable as the next person mm-hmm. someone who's got absolutely no skills and has invested their entire future in money and property they may somehow survive i mean it's just there's no guarantees and that's what is what makes life so interesting and amazing um at the same time, I, I, I'm glad I'm hedging my bets and you know, <laughs> developing the skills and that may help myself or my family or friends or neighbours or community or any stranger we meet to live a better life, even for five minutes. And, and not, um, yeah, I think that's why this work with the men's work um, that I'm doing with a bunch of local men here is really important to that too. Uh, well, 
I really appreciate your time today, mm. Patrick. It's been it's been an excellent conversation. Um, where can the people find you? Uh, so yeah, we blog at artistasfamily.is.is dot is, and um, yeah, we we make films there, write blog posts, um, and we just started a little podcast series. But yeah, most of our resources are there. We're also on YouTube as well. Excellent. Yeah. And do you do you guys do workshops and stuff? Yeah. We take volunteers, yep. and there's information about that on our website. Um, yeah, so we take volunteers for a week, and um, basically people for a week get an immersive experience. It's, 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 a, it's, it's like woofing, but it's not so, it's more relational, and um, so we're interested in people's stories and what, what they bring. It's not just, we need some weeds pulled, even though it might be with weeding, yep. it could be fermenting. Um, ecological uh, wood harvesting, um, you know, e everything from closing the poop loop, um, growing food, saving seeds, just whatever the season is, but just getting an immersive experience in what an alternative post neoliberal economy looks like. Um, it's certainly a dominant, I, yeah, I, I, we sort of put it at eighty percent that we're no longer reliant on the global pool of money, if you like to use that expression. Um, yeah. So, and also, I think the importance of that is to show people that it's possible. Yeah. So it's not to necessarily live the way that we would do it because each household would respond differently. Yeah. To the skill set, to the to the land, to whatever is present, um, but just to to show that. Um, living this way is can actually happen without running to the hills and creating a bunker, and becoming a unibomber. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it and still connect to the culture and still um, engage with the culture. It's an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Excellent. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate it.